today the goal is to tell you all about opera ads, um, or at least get you to how to think about opera ads and tell you the path of the definition. Um, so, first we'll pick up where we left off yesterday, um, talking about curl limits, but I sort of want to specialize here and talk about curl limits in possibly the simplest interesting setting, which is the category of finite sets. So, just a reminder, um, the sort of slogan from yesterday was that curl limits summarize how this word was a little contentious, but it, I think it's fine. Um, diagrams as objects. So this takes place in a category, we'll call it C. What does a diagram mean? A diagram is a functor, which I'll call a D, from some other category into C. Um, so we said, David said this other category should be a small category, and you could take that sort of Technically, in which case it means a category where the object, the, the collection of objects is a, a proper set, but you might also just think of I as, as just something that you feel is small. Uh, we'll see examples. Um, so it takes this diagram and summarizes it as an object. And the object we call the curl limit of the diagram. Okay, so. Or let's, let's just, David did a bit of the test day, but I want to go over it again. Wait, let me also give you a tiny bit more detail, which we saw yesterday, which in David's presentation, how did we do this? We had this diagram, right, conveniently drawn it here. We take the functor to the one, element, one object category, and then we look for sort of the best, in some sense, um, Functor that sort of factors, well, weakly factors the diagram. So it's taking the diagram but pushing it through a single object. And there's this notion of best which says that it has, there's at once uh, a natural transformation from this functor to this composite, and that if there's any competing functor with a natural transformation to it, this thing is initial. It's, it's better, it sort of it has a map to that. Okay, so. David said that um, the empty category gives you the initial object. So you haven't seen a definition of an initial object um, apart from that. So the definition is an initial object in a category. Um, well, let's just say everything takes place in a category. So an initial object um, is an object. Set such that there exists a unique map such that for all other objects x, there exists a unique map so from the empty set to x, or from the initial object to x. So in particular, in the category of finite sets, um, this curl limit of this sort of empty thing, empty diagram, is actually the empty set. Um, Given any other set x, there's a unique function from the empty set to x, which is, well, what is a function? They're saying for every element of this, pick an element of x, but there are no elements, so there's only one way to do that. Okay. Would you mind writing unique after your word exists? There exists, thanks. Um, so this will also be a uh, sort of, uh, this, this phrase here will use this symbol, there exists, unique. Okay, so another example to take is I equals the two element things, and, uh, the discrete two element category, and we call this coproducts. So, coproduct um, of two objects, X and Y. So, how this relates to this diagram is that the functor from this two category is just two objects in that category. Um, is, let's see. An object x plus y um, 
equipped actually with maps from X and from Y. So if you unpack that, that's the natural transformation um, running to the co-limit. Um, but then we have this universality property. And so this is that such that, so we have this thing such that for any other pair of objects, sorry, let's call this object uh, C for competitor, for, for any other object with two maps to it, there exists a unique map. Um, there, that make these diagrams commute. So the commutativity is the naturality. Uh, oh, no, sorry, the commutativity is the commutativity of the natural transformations. Um, so in the category of finite sets, um, the co-product is the distribution. So if we have, uh, what I mean by this is that if we have some two sets, say x equals 1, 2, and y equals 1, 3, then people often consider the union, which is 1, 2, 3. But the disjoint union considers these two instances of the, the element 1 as, as distinct. Um, so we can consider it, say, as the set with four elements, we have a 1 coming from the set x, 2 coming from the set x, but then a 1 coming from the set y, and a 3 comes from the set y. Okay, um, so a way to think of this visually, maybe, is that if we have a set with two points, a set with another two points, then there's a sense that the disjoint union or the co-product is just having them both at once. Right. Let's just take the two bags of dots and put them into a single bag. Um, and how we get this function from, from x to, from, from the co-product to any other competitor say is that if we have um, if we have some other set C with functions f and g, we can define this unique map that this promised unique map um, like this. So we take an element of the disjoint union and if it's an element of x, then we do x f and if it's an element of B, L, y, we do g. Right. So that gives us a unique map to any other pattern. So again, this definition is rather dense uh, of this sort of abstract definition of arbitrary co-limits using Khan extensions. is is dense and it takes a while to unpack um, both as you do it and a while to sink in. Um, so I don't expect it to be easy to sort of compute out the definition to see these if you haven't seen it before. But this is just some examples. Uh, one more important example is the push-out, which David also mentioned yesterday. Uh, so this is where the diagram category looks like this. Um, so the definition of push-out, so what's the data? It's a pair of maps. Um, so a sort of part of the partition is also known as an equivalence class, 
And so we have this set here with all these elements, and we say that two elements are the same if uh, they're the image of some element of A. So we say that if they're both the image of the same element of A or some sort of transitive closure on this. So we identify f of A and g of A, and then chase around like we saw in the diagram yesterday. So in particular, um, for example, if I draw some sets, this is that's A, this is X, this is Y, sets. Let me draw some functions. Let's say, let's sorry, this one was good for some reason. Um, then the push out, so these, this, has a two, this set has two elements, and this map element maps to here, and this element maps to here. And the push out uh, consists of, it's, it's sort of, it's, first we think of the, the six elements of these, this co-product or the disjoint union, and then we identify ones that are mapped to by the same element of something up here. So this one and this one are identified because they're part of the same thing and so is this one and this one. Uh, so in fact, we end up with four elements because these, those three become the same element. And the function looks like this. So in some sense, what it's doing is you can think of these points as being sort of this thing topologically as collapsing connected components to a point. So these, these three things were connected through paths in here, and we sort of squished them together, and they became this point here in the, the push out. And this sort of flavor of push outs is what's going to be important in this lecture. So after that review, let me give you um, press some questions. What are the push outs? Do some simple ones. Um, that. that. That's the empty set, so those functions are the, the trivial ones. Start off, find a friend, I'll give you a few minutes, try and figure out at least the, you can shout out and say how many elements the push outs of each of these three things have. Which one's the second one? Sorry, no, on the right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Why, why does it have one? <laughs> the thing on the, in the middle is the empty set. So he said to make them connect, make them the same if there's some A, where one of them is A and one of them is A. There are no A. Okay, I agree. Um, you don't get why it's universal objects of a certain property or what the formula is. <laughs> right. The concept is I want something that can holds an X, holds all of X and all of Y, but I don't. But I want A 
to, no matter whether it comes through X or comes through Y, to like um, just be one, every element of H just be one thing for me. Like, I, yeah. Mm, okay. So when A, so A is amphibians, X is the land animals, and Y is the water animals, yeah. then I want to just, I don't want to count an amphibian twice. So anything that's in A, um, I will identify as a land animal as a water animal. That's what it's mm -hmm. so, Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? These are all in one. These are all in one category. To another object. To another object in the category. Okay. Any? If you want to try to answer. What's the What's the push out here? Yeah, okay. so this is very simple. Uh, the push out here? Yeah, it's just an eight object set. Does the one on the left, on the right, have three or four? I'm sorry, this is three. So it's a seven object set. Um, and then the, it comes equipped with two functions, um, but that basically is basically name your objects. Right? So these are the copies of these objects, and these things down here are the copies of these objects. By elements. Uh, what about this thing? It's another one object thing. Um, and the reason is that everything's connected through this diagram. And it's one way to understand it. Okay. So, um, so definition in finite co um, just to be clear, is a co where the diagram I. Uh, this, this category, which is the domain of the diagram, has finitely many morphisms. Oh, well, finitely many, many objects, and save for morphisms. Um, so, there's a nice theorem. Sort of already seen that the push out of two things over the initial object, to have an initial object, which is here, the empty set. The push out of these two things is just given by the product. Um, but in fact, um, in any category, um, if, let's call it C, if C always has, so whenever, oh, if C has an initial object, and for any diagram, it has, always has a push out. Then it has all finite. It doesn't have just have the co-products as well, but it has all finite components. Um, so that's a nice, nice fact to know. Um, if you want to showing something has all finite co-limits, so it means that you can always draw any any diagram that you can actually draw, which will be finite. And so you can always ask for this, this co-limit of it, the summary of it, and it will always exist as long as you know it has push-outs and an initial object. Are initial objects unique? Everything, every co-limit is unique up to unique isomorphism. Uh, what that means is basically yes, up to some renaming. So the empty set is actually unique, um, but something like the, the disjoint union is not unique in general in that um, I haven't actually told you some formal way to construct the set x plus y. So I could have called the elements of the set like uh, 1 prime and 1 or something like that instead of 1x and 1y. But any reasonable construction, for, for any construction, there will always be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements that respect these inclusions. So it's, it's effectively unique. Um, it's unique up to renaming. You can make that argument abstractly so it works in any category. Um, just by the this sort of this this sort of existence of a unique lab means that if you have two possible co-products, a co-product here and another co-product would have maps to it, and there would be a unique map from there to there. But because this thing is a co-product, I'm uh, sorry, because this thing is a co-product, it would have a unique map back the other way, and they have to be isomorphisms again by uh, sorry inverses again by uniqueness. That's a good question. So when people talk
talk about co-limits and limits and things like that, they'll often say the limit, the product, the initial object. Um, it is not strictly sort of true that there's only one, so it may be an abuse of, of grammar, but it's close enough to be true that it's a good way to think about things. Okay, so a corollary of that thing is that because we, I've told you what uh, initial objects and uh, push outs are in the category of finite sets, we see that the category of finite sets is all, all finite curl limits. Um, and they have, again, this flavor that we saw there of just gluing things together. Um, so, so a more complicated curl limit um, where I have a bunch of sets. And then I have functions between them so all sorts of directions. Um, Yeah, also a function back the other way. Uh, well, uh, the curl limit of a diagram like this, which represents five objects, and I guess I maybe should put arrowheads in, but I draw four I drew four different functions, um, is just going to be the collapsing of this thing into some set of connected components once you view it like this, where you view sort of maps as edges. So in particular the push out, oh, sorry, the curl limit of this will have five elements, one corresponding to this, one corresponding to this, one corresponding to this, one corresponding to this, and one corresponding to this entire mess here. Um, uh, you also, for the curl limit, you want this natural transformation from the diagram, so you have a function from each set here to the curl limit that, uh, that sort of tracks how you went from this big diagram, at, or how you took each of these small pieces, and turned it into one of the pieces in the curl limit. And that's just the sort of obvious projection map. So everything in this big mass maps to the dot that represents it. But, um, I guess it's also essentially the, the partition that we talked about earlier. OK. Um, so I guess the slogan is like that. Curl limits in finite sets um, drew things together. And since most categories we deal with algebraically at least are based on the category of at least sets, uh, curl limits often have this intuition. Okay, so we'll move on to part two, which is the symmetric model category of crisp bands. name um, for a pair of morphisms with a common codomain. So they look exactly like the opposite of this diagram, the push out. Um, the thing, of, well, we call things that we push out over spans, and since these are the same sort of thing, the arrows reverse, we call these co-spans. Okay. So then, um, let's call it a theorem, although it's more like a definition for you, the purpose here. Um, so there is a symmetric Minoto category called co-spans of finite sets, and um, the symmetric Minoto category co-span in the set has, so it's a category, it's firstly a category, so the objects uh, Sets. So, right, something like X. Morphisms. So if I want to know what is in the Hong set from X to Y, um, these are cospans from X to Y. Are you brushing the equivalence thing under the rug? Yes. Um, there are some morphism classes of cospans. So what this means is that if I change the names of all these elements in N to different names, then it's still the same cross band. Uh, and then, so I'm telling you a category. Um, 
So I told you the objects and the morphisms, I need to know what the composition rule of is. And this is why um, it's important to consider categories. So you can do this construction with any category with finite co-limits. But FinSet here is our proxy for such a category because we know it has finite co-limits. Um, is, that, is that an arrow from x to y or y to x? Ah, good question. It's an arrow. This thing is an arrow from x to y. But you've noticed that, it's, that there's a, a sort of bijection between arrows from x to y and arrows from y to x. Uh -huh. um, and this is an important part of the categorical structure or the way you at least work with it. Um, so if I have an arrow from x to y um, and an arrow, let me just concatenate it. An arrow from m, m comes up to m. So not, um, an arrow from y to z. Then, how might I get a single coastband coast from x to z? Right. In one, a single arrow, I want some Ella object there. And an arrow from x to the object, and an arrow from z to the object. And how I sort of sum, so I want to summarize this coastband information. And the way I do that is I take the push out of this in middle span here. So if I take the push out, I get some object there. And then now I can compose these two things to get a map from x to that thing and a map from z to that thing. So the reason this is a theorem and not a definition is that it's non-trivial to check that this thing is an associative composition. Um, the identities are just uh, identities. So if, you have, if these three things are, just to get the identity cosband, the identity cosband runs from x to x, uh, you make the apex, the center thing, x, and you make the two functions, the identity functions. And it turns out that you, when you push out something along that, an identity function, it remains the same. Um, and you can kind of see that in a diagram, right? If I have some, something here, and there's the identity over here, how do I summarize that? Well, um, this thing didn't really do anything, so all the information, you just kind of duplicate that side over. Um, and so if we have f, and the identity of the push out is the identity on the domain and f, code domain and f. That's rather quick, but that kind of argument works more abstractly. OK. Um, I'm telling you a symmetric monoidal category. Uh, I also want to tell you the monoidal product. So here we're just going to use the, the co-products, um, so disjoint union of things. So if I have a pair of functions from, well, okay, on objects, the, the co-product is, the monoidal product is really just the co-product of objects. So we take set x and attack set z, and we take the disjoint union. Um, and morphisms, we can basically do the same thing. Uh, so the, the sort of schematic picture is so that if I have show these things um, and that curse bands, right, I can just run these into one big thing. And that's a new curse band from x plus c to n plus n plus from y plus w. Okay. So that's the data. Uh, a symmetric monoidal category has these things that help you help witness the associativity and unitality of these, these composition rules. Um, I'm not going to tell you them, but the theorem is that they exist and the data everything checks out. This is an associative composition. This is a, a sort of weakly associative monoidal product and so on. So let me go back. I, I've given you a sort of schematic picture of the monoidal product. Let me also give you a schematic picture of, of composition. Um, so the idea is that if we take um, some sets, Here's one curse band. This for this. So that's off the first function. The other function goes like this. 
Then the second curse band, So what's the composite of these two coast bands? Um, it's a coast band. It's a coast band from X to Z, and then the apex is the pushout of this interior part here. So it's the number of connected components of of this section. So there's one here, one here, one here, and then another one here. So there's four. And then we compose, and then there's a canonical map from here that says that maps to the corresponding connected component. Um, and if we compose, so if we map sort of each thing here through this and then to its connected component, we see that this first dot goes to that thing, the second dot goes to the second one. This, that function was not very interesting. Um, and coming back the other way, this one is part of the thing that maps to the first connected component, and these three all map to the I guess, last connected component. So this is the composite curse band. So another way to visualize this sort of thing, though, uh, is, is to appeal more to an intuition that looks like circuit diagrams. So instead, I'm going to now think of x, the, these things, as the boundary of a circuit. So I have. have some circuit X with these sort of four ports coming up. And then, so this is the object X. Um, and what a coast band does is it takes one of these things and turns it into something on this boundary Y where there are six points coming up. Um, I want to make that a tiny bit smaller. Let's make that again. X has four things. Y. This curse band then connects these sort of four things to these five things. So it says that this thing is connected out to that one. Um, these three are connected through some point there. And then this one just kind of comes out and vanishes. And this one is connected out like that. You can view x to y as sort of taking a something that you might slot in there, something, and pushing it out to something. Oh, sorry, pushing it out is a bad word. Uh, connecting things up and, and pulling it, kind of redoing the connectivity pattern so it looks like that. And then similarly, uh, this morphism from y to z, you do it a similar way. So how many ports should I have in the boundary of circle that represents z? Four. Yeah. Okay. And then inside we have these three connected components apparently. Um, and there's some connectivity pattern that says that this curse band here translates into a sort of Y comes out to these things. And then C comes maps in. Nothing goes to that one in these three points over here. Okay, so that looks a bit funny. Uh, but we can sort of summarize, if we're only interested in the connectivity pattern, so these, these sort of blue wires sum up some sort of connectivity pattern between the inside ports and the outside ports. And if we're only interested in the connectivity pattern, then we might summarize this diagram. Um, y is now invisible because it's completely internal. Um, but we might summarize this thing by saying we have four ports on X and four points on Z. And then this sort of first port is connected to there. These ports don't go anywhere. And then these three ports are connected to, to this port here. So 
if we have some sort of intuition, say, where we think of these as uh, ideal wires that are, are matching things together, uh, sort of matching conductive terminals together, or maybe if we're thinking of this as a pattern of matching variables, um, this, if we sort of quotient out of the internal stuff, then this is exactly this new pattern of, of interaction or connectivity between these boundary variables. So this category of, of this symmetric monodal category of co-spans captures this notion of uh, identification of variables or of connectivity. Um, so you can build upon that to do sort of create um, some interesting new sort of syntaxes for, for various forms of logic, um, which sort of co correspond to that variable sharing idea. But something sort of more visually appear appealing is to, to think about circuit diagrams from this perspective. So let me tell you about how to do that. Question? No, question? Yeah. Is it interesting to think of these as like some for, for some form of inputs and outputs, or is that outside of the scope? Um, it's It's interesting. Um, you can draw some sort of philosophical lessons. Well, it depends what you mean by input and output, really. Um, and so, if you're if you're thinking about, say, something like a circuit, uh, I don't know, just like a battery, um, you can say that the appropriate notion of boundary is just to have these two points. Um, and you might model that with the domain and co-domain of a, of a crispan or of a morphism. Uh, but which one should you consider the input and output? There's like a formal distinction you could make that says, uh, well, we'll consider this one the input because it's the domain, and the other one the input because it's the co-domain. Uh, I'm sorry, output because it's the co-domain. And you can sort of work with that, and that might be a sensible use of the word input and output. But it doesn't really have strong semantic content in that, as sort of Renard observed earlier, you can. It, that these, these co-spans are somehow unoriented. So you could flip this and you could consider the output and input and input the output and it wouldn't really make a semantic difference. Um, so there's sort of, in this particular structure, there's a layer of orientedness to it that you could think about, um, but you should also think about the ways that the oriented nature are kind of irrelevant to the core of the structure. And that's sort of some discussion about input and output in this setting. There's another question out there. Yep. Yeah, so based on these diagrams, it seems like you could represent the same information in the diagram as a relation on x cross y. Um, is it cooked, right? Because you can just say which x's and y's are connected. Um, is there data that's not represented in the diagram that's important about a co-span that has to do with n and the morphisms that you're choosing for it? So this is. In fine set, in fine that, That's a good observation. Um, so relations are a special form of span in the category of finite sets that are jointly monic span. Um, co well, these, so these co-spans are kind of the dual notion, and they're much more closely connected to equivalence relations. And the, the difference between what's going on here is that this structure, when you would, if you just consider these things as relations, you're ultimately interested in the equivalence relation that results because you're interested in the connectivity pattern. And so if you compose them as relations, you don't get an equivalence relation always. You need to take the transitive closure of the relation to return it to an equivalence relation. You, like, you join one relation with another one on Y, it seems. Or, or maybe. Yeah. Or it seems yeah. like a database join style thing would give you the composition. Yeah, you have to do some sort of chase around things. Um, so let's continue the discussion after, but sort of a way of summarizing that information is that there's sort of a function from uh, the category of relations to the category of co-spans, or the other way around, uh, but there's no functorial map in either direction.
but you might be able to guess uh, to some extent. So uh, it goes from, it's sort of a pair of structures because I've dropped off the unit, but the nodal category is now through them. The nodal categories have this sort of extra data floating around, so I need this extra bit of data in the functor to relate the monoidal structures. So, a symmetry of monoidal functor, blah, is a functor um, f from c to d, and then uh, functions, oh, oh no, sorry, the morphism phi of i, well, i represents the unit which takes care of the relationship between the unit here and the unit here. So in particular, we have i of d, um, but we also have f of i of the node of unit in c. And so phi is a morphism in d that relates these two things. And then for every pair of x, y, we also have some pair of things that relates. So the image of x, monoidal product in D, or the image in Y, to the image of the monoidal product in C of x and Y. Right. Plus coherence. So there are some things that, just like associativity and a unitality, that these things need to obey. So should I say this is a rough definition. Okay. So, Hypergraph prop or? Oh, sorry. I'm just a hypergraph prop. Um, so, again, that's sort of a fuller definition of hypergraph category where we allow our objects to, to vary, but because the objects here are quite simple, um, it's, it's more prop like and that can be made precise. So, in particular, uh, how would this work for some sort of model of circuits? Um, so, the slogan then is something like circuits form a hypergraph category. And so there should be a functor for circuits um, from first band of finite sets to set uh, a functor. How do we think of this? It takes some set of x and it maps it to the set of circuits with boundary x. So for example, if we took some set um, of, of four elements, I can go just write it like this. Um, this maps to the set of all things that are circuits with that sort of boundary. So I could have some sort of empty circuit where none of these things are connected by anything. I could have like, some patterns of wires that say there is a connected like that. I could have a circuit where there's a resistor, a light bulb connecting these things and a battery down here. And I could connect them all together and put a resistor between them. And maybe I should put a resistor there too and a resistor there. I'm trying to avoid short circuits. I feel like that. And so on. Right. These, are, these are circuit components with boundary or circuit open circuits. So circuits that have some notion of boundary and the boundary is, is four elements there. Okay, so that's what this functor on the circuits does on objects. Why am I organizing this structure as a functor? Um, the reason is because 
these, these morphisms. Um, so a morphism that is a co-span of finite sets uh, is going to map to then some sort of thing from circuits on X, a function. So a morphism in here is a co-span, a morphism in here is a function. So a co-span maps to a function from circuits on X to circuits on Y. And so if I pick some sort of co-span, say, like this, then this turns into the function that, say, um, takes that circuit down here, which is a circuit on, on X with a resistor and a light bulb and a battery, and then maps it to this sort of, uh, it's embedding inside there, which we compute as a push out. So it ends up connecting these circuit parts. Right. And so this is just this is just an example, one action of this co-span as a function from circuits on four to circuits on two. Um, but the overall picture though is that this this category here forms some sort of theory of composition um, or some sort of diagrammatic or not necessarily diagrammatic just some sort of general notion of grammar it says how we can sort of stick things together to create new terms and then so in, uh, well so the objects so let me be a bit more precise the objects are like types so here we have the type 4 and it maps, well, oh, okay, here we have the type 4, and here we have some sort of, and the morphisms, like this one here, are ways of taking terms of type 4 and creating a term of type 2. And this sort of functor specifies the language. It takes this grammar and instantiates it, instantiates it and says, okay, we have this type 4, here are all my things of type my terms of type 4, and here are all my terms of type 2, and then it takes one of our sort of grammatical constructions and says this, this abstract like, syntactic structure takes a term of type, is instantiated to take this particular term of type 4 to this particular term of type 2, and so on. So, um, so that gets me to the idea of an operad. So an operad can be thought of as a theory for composition. Um, so, so far, we've seen many sorts of theories of composition. This, so this notion of category, where we can take these morphisms and compose them and get another morphism. Right? Or we have monoidal categories that allow us to have a theory of composition that, so this is a symmetric monoidal category, that where these boxes could have more than one inputs, there could be an output, there could be in parallel, and the wires can swap, things like that. And then we're seeing this notion of a hypergraph, prop at least, a hypergraph category, which is just a theory of composition where we have arbitrary sort of wirings between things. So what is the overall structure of not a model of these theories that we've been thinking about so far, but the, the general notion of theory? And then once we have that, so the reason we'll be interested in that is because then we can start adjusting. Uh, we don't just consider different sorts of categories or trying to throw a structure on top of our categories. We can sort of, from scratch, create new theories of composition that are somehow coherent with respect in the same way that these structures are coherent. So 
one perspective on this is provided by an operad. Here's a rough definition of an operad. An operad is, so I'm going to call it O, is a set, uh, which I'll call of O. Um, these are called objects, um, but often in operad, very, we call them types too. Um, and then for every sort of tuple of objects of length n plus 1, so for every tuple t1 to tn and then another object t, uh, we have um, a set which we're going to call the operations or the morphisms. Um, and we'll just label that O of T1 to Tn T. These are morphisms or operations. Then, so there's some relationship with the category. We had objects and we had morphisms, but here instead of morphisms being taking a domain and a codomain, they take a list of domains and a, and a single codomain. Um, so now we want a composition rule. So um, we need composition rules that if we have some thing from S1, Sm that goes to some type Ti, and we have some morphism of this type, T1 to Tn T. So given a, a morphism of this type and this type, we can kind of plug the output of, of this thing into the i component of this thing, because the types match up. Um, and this gets a single composite morphism, which runs from sort of T1 to Ti minus 1. And then we do the S's, and then we do the rest of the input t's, tn. Yeah. So it takes morphism of this type and this type and returns a morphism of this type. So this thing here is called um, composition. Um, this part. That thing there is called Position. And then lastly, um, we want identities. So for every type T, we have a special element, the identity of T, in this set of four morphisms with one input and one output. So this is identities. So just like a category with objects, morphisms, composition, identity, but our composition is sort of uh, also, notion of morphism is, is multi-input. And so then we sort of have plus, so we need unitality and associativity. Okay. So, So this is the notion of operad, and you can kind of see that these form operads where our types, so this is a map from sort of this type, this type, and this type to a single thing of this type. Right? So this is a sort of a three-area input. There's uh, T1, T2, T3, and this object there is T. And so you can play with sort of these different definitions. There's an operad for categories, an operad for symmetric monoidal categories, an operad for hypergraph categories and so on. There are these operads in topology called like the little n cubes operad, which is like this but without the wires. Uh, and then from every symmetric monoidal category, you also get a notion of operad. So in particular, um, this operad here for hypergraph categories is just the operad corresponding to the symmetric monoidal category of cospans of finite sets. But then to, there's also a symmet an operad corresponding then to the category of sets, because that's also a, well, a symmetric nodal category of sets. And 
if you're interested in not just your theory of composition, but an actual category or an actual hypergraph category, then you do this same sort of construction where you take a, a functor, but now an operator functor, to a uh, sort of world where the semantics can live. Um, so to a set, so to, usually to sets. So you've got a set of uh, terms of your particular types or objects, or, and then these transformations between sets of terms. <coughs> so that's sort of a general picture, um, which really sort of concludes this march through compositional structures that we've done over the past three weeks. Um, although, in, and the next lecture will be more, next two lectures will be a bit more about logical structures in, in category theory, which are still very interesting. I'll leave it there.